Hello, Silicon Valley. Oh, come on. Hello, Silicon Valley. Right. Welcome to Idea to IPO. My name is Rob. I organize Idea to IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 600,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 4,300 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. As I mentioned, we launched officially on February 1st, 2010. What day is today? That's 14 long years. No applause? Thank you. Thank you for all your support. We hold venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. We hold an event every day of the week. Check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. Our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that is practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. We believe in building community because Silicon Valley is a global aspirational ecosystem. It attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Okay, well, who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Wow. All, all 10 of you. Well, welcome, natives. Uh, so whether you were born and raised here or just arrived last night, it's important for us to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. With regard to value, it's important that we provide value at each and every one of our events, not just value for your money, which is important because we know many entrepreneurs are struggling financially, so we make sure our events are free or affordable, and if you cannot afford the cover charge for whatever reason, come talk to me and we can work something out. And at most of our speaker events, we make sure that we provide a delicious buffet. Yeah. Is that a delicious buffet? Come on, is that a delicious buffet? More importantly, at each and every one of our events, we want to make sure that we provide value for your time, which is your most valuable resource. Anyone here getting any younger? Besides this young man and this young lady and our panel? So when you invest your valuable time to come to our events, we want to make sure that you maximize your ROI. We have many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities, and lots of other players in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Today, we're grateful to the College of San Mateo for hosting us at this beautiful venue. Is this a beautiful venue? Yeah. Oh, come on, is this a beautiful venue? Some of our other partners are here. I would like to have them say a few words. Let's hear it for Ken and Cordify. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken. Uh, I'm repres I represent Cordify. We do software development for startups, uh, we, whether it is your idea to MVP stage or, or any other part of your journey. Uh, at the idea to MVP stage, you come to us with an idea, and we, we, have, we actually have solutions architects who can sit with you, flesh out the idea, start building the product from scratch. Uh, we normally try and bring out the MVP in four to six weeks' time for normal MVPs, for normal products, and if it is slightly more complicated, it might take six to eight weeks. But we try and bring it as early as possible, because we don't like to spend too much of money at the MVP stage. Uh, we also have... Uh, see many startups uh, coming to us without uh, a technical lead or a technical founder. And in those cases, we actually provide what is called as a fractional CTO services, 
where uh, we have a panel of CTOs, veterans, they've been around for 15 to 20, uh, 15 to 20 years, and uh, you can choose any one of them, and they will actually help you architect your product, build your team, and even go to investors for funding. So uh, come see us at our desk outside. Uh, have me and my colleagues are there, and we'll talk to you more about our services. Have a good day. All right, next up, we have George from SVB. Applause. Uh, how's it going, everyone? So uh, my name is George. I'm from Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, yeah, that bank. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, so, uh, you know, last year we had a slight bump in the road, uh, but, <laughs> but I would say best case scenario, we have a new parent company that came in, First Citizens Bank. Uh, they've really been admiring what we've been doing, so uh, they told us, you know what, business as usual on the ground floor. So it's allowing us to be back in market, you know, doubling down on our efforts. Uh, so I'm a part of our early stage startup banking group, so working with companies from ideation through Series A. Uh, you know, my main role is how do we help banking services, but a majority of my role is how do we help beyond banking. Uh, having events like this, or being a part of events like this, uh, connecting the dots with investors, uh, and other fun stuff like that. So if you have any questions, feel free to find us in the back, but I uh, just want to say uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you. Right, next up we have Patricia from Graham Adair. Applause. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia. I'm one of the partners at Graham Adair. We're an immigration firm specializing in business-based immigration. So we can assist you with everything from non-immigrant visas all the way to the green card process. If you have any questions, we have a table outside, so please come see us. Thank you. So though our local mission is to support entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley, our global mission is to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world. To that end, we maintain a robust YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to IPO. Check it out, we have tons of videos there. And this rich, valuable content is available on demand, anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jiggers, one of the top professional videographers and digital marketing experts in Silicon Valley. Let's hear it for Tim. Applause. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody. So my name's Tim. I have been doing video stuff for like 20 plus years. I turned it into a full-time job about 10 years ago. I launched my own production company about five years ago. And being kind of an entrepreneur myself, there was a lot of bootstrapping, and I had to learn how to do a ton of stuff around that to make my company successful. So that's kind of what sets me apart when it comes to digital media production. Uh, I've been in you know, a lot of entrepreneurs' shoes. It's a little different because I open a wedding company, which is kind of a different space. But I had to learn the SEO, I had to learn the marketing, social media, website design, graphic design, kind of all things I learned to go along with the video production. So yeah, kind of what I do is events, informational content, and you know, I really look under the hood for my clients and figure out what they're about, what makes them special. And yeah, the people I work with, you know, tend to be pretty happy because I am all about the win, win, win. I want them to win because their customers are winning. And then I win because I stay in my job. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about video production, I'll be around all day. Um, I have cards in the back. I'm kind of working today, so I don't have a lot of time to talk. But in between uh, the discussions, I'd be more than happy to chat for a little bit. And I think that's pretty much all I've got to say, so thank you. Here's the schedule for the rest of the summit. We have three awesome panels. There'll be a half hour break in between. The final panel will wrap up at about 8.30 p.m. You can stick around, network, socialize, and connect. There will be an after party. More on that later. So it's time for our first panel, venture capital panel, investment and latest innovations in energy and climate tech. So here's the format. Our panel will hold a brilliant, compelling, dynamic, entertaining, and scintillating discussion Right, panel? And then we're going to, after 50 minutes of discussion, we'll open up to questions from the audience for about half an hour, so there'll be time for audience participation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our distinguished moderator, Armand Palavon, partner at Perkins Coie. So let's give it up for Armand and our panel. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Hello, everybody. My name is Arman Palavan. I'm a partner at Perkins Coie, uh, a global law firm. I sit in the Palo Alto office, but we serve clients throughout the world. Um, my practice is emerging companies of venture capital and private equity. I do I, the work for establishing the funds that then go ahead and invest in, make investments in portfolio companies. When there's investments on a minority basis, that's what we call venture capital. And when there's com control investments, we call it private equity. And then we serve as outside general counsel to the portfolio companies and we help them grow and prosper and liquidate and go public and sell and all those great things. I am, I'm delighted to be here. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to really acknowledge what Rob is doing. Rob is, uh, has been doing this for a couple of decades. And, um, you know, this is really an important part of the ecosystem in Silicon Valley. You may be sitting here today and just kind of like, you know, saying, okay, each one has its own agenda. But, you know, I would venture to guess that at least one or two of you will, will end up having some very significant companies that will change many things that we do today in our behaviors in the uh, variety of technology sectors. So, um, my hat off to all of you who will be doing that. Thank you for attending. And really, special thanks and uh, applause for Rob for doing what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, we have a wonderful panel today um, with uh, six speakers. And, um, and I, I would like to just take a moment to just go through each one of you guys and ladies to introduce yourselves. and tell us what you do and personally and about the funds that you're associated with. And since Sanjit came last, we will start with Sanjit. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello, Sanjit. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you, buddy? Great to see you. Always. Thank you. Thank you. And so sorry uh, for coming why don't you go, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and about the, the, you know, the fund you're working with. We, we'd love to hear more about, about what, what you do. Thank you. Thank you. And big thanks to Rob again. Really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Sanjeet Dang. I have been in Bay Area now for 20 plus years, and I'm sorry for coming late. I can blame it on the weather, but it, the fault is all mine. Um, um, I used to be at Intel Capital, when driving investments in uh, enterprise software and AI, and now uh, I co-run a firm called U First Capital. We have invested in 25 or so companies, primarily around enterprise software, and we go across stages, so we do early stages, early stage investments as well. But we also do little later stage investments. We have done, we are investors in OpenAI. We are also investors in Cohere AI. We have invested in a few Elon Musk companies as well, Neuralink, SpaceX, Twitter. We, early stage, we have done companies like DevRev, if you're familiar with the Nutanix, that the CEO and co-founder of Nutanix, along with uh, Manoj, who was also an executive at Nutanix, both of them left and created DevRev. We are investors in DevRev and so on. Um, our uh, check sizes at an early stage, I would say two to three million. So at a seed, Series A. And uh, we tend to, our, our bar for the founder uh, quality is very high. So we do look for founders who really understand the domain very well. And typically, we invest together with tier one VCs. Uh, Sanjit, wonderful. Thank you so much. If, if you guys would please enunciate a little bit heavier, you know, because I, I think it may be a little bit difficult to hear everything we're saying. At least I can't hear it that well. But maybe you guys can hear it great. So thank you so much, Sanjit. Nari, please, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Nare. Uh, my background started when, when yeah, from grad school. Um, that's where my journey started in climate. I have a PhD from Harvard, and that's where I was studying material science using metal-based nanomaterials for uh, sustainable chemical production. 
after my PhD, I went to consulting, a hard pivot, and didn't like the lab, ready for the business world, um, where I was working with growth stage companies, a lot of the unicorns you see around here in SF. Uh, they were my clients, and I was working on their commercialization strategies. So I know where these startups need to go, and I entered VC after. So now I'm at Voyager Ventures, specializing in climate tech. Uh, we only invest in climate tech companies. Pre-seed to Series A is our specialty. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan. Testing, testing. So I should call you Dr. Nari. My name is Jordan Wabe, and we're Silicon Valley Venture Group. We do investments in pre-A and A. We are uh, in deep tech. Um, companies that improve the human condition contribute in a positive way to business, to, to countries, to humanity, but we're not a social or a uh, impact investor. Um, check sizes, 300 to 500. We uh, collaborate with other VCs. We follow on their lead. We are the closers. Hey, Rod, I see you out there. Um, you brought your wife with you today. That's even better. Nope. <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> R R Creating said problems. Scintillating. He said it's scintillating, so that's all good, right? Um, the climate is uh, fundamental in so many ways. Uh, what we're seeing at the borders in Texas is climate-driven. The war in the Middle East, in Syria, it's climate-driven. The issues in the Far East, it's all climate-driven because it's a loss of food. It's a loss of habitat. So the investment and the climate other than capital gains, it's fundamental to our existence as people. So from my point of view, while I do across multiple uh, sectors, climate and things that attribute to climate are important because it's more than just making money. It's really important for us to live and exist. Um, other than that, I welcome you to check us out. Come visit with us, see us. Uh, we do two or three deals a month. We have 15 companies' investment in 2023 with 50 in our portfolio. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend. Hi. Can you – oh, that sounds good. Yep. Um, I'm Zoe Samuel. I'm a venture partner at Starshot Capital. And um, I only have a, a, a bachelor's. I didn't even go to grad school. So, you know, the, thank God we have a doctor in the house over here. Um, and so uh, we invest in pre-seed, seed, and Series A in three verticals, the built environment, food, land, and agriculture, and industry and manufacturing. Um, and I was previously at Google where I co-founded Anthropocene, which is Google's largest internal uh, employee climate community where we supported most of Google's flagship climate products. Uh, so yeah, please do uh, reach out, Starshot Capital. We, have, we are very new, so we have only six companies, um, although you'll see a seventh blurred out on the website has arrived today. Um, so it's very exciting, I think, as of last night. And then uh, number eight coming shortly. So. How new is new? Oh, we are a wee slip of a phone. No, we are, we are on fund one, and um, we are 18 months old. Thank you. Raghu, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Raghu Marabushi, uh, investor at uh, National Grid Partners. This is the CVC arm of uh, National Grid, which is this big utility in the UK, and in, uh, I think, like five states in the US, uh, Northeast. Uh, um, mostly investing in uh, Series A, Series B, so it's slightly later stage or mid or later stage. Uh, um, uh, energy transition in general, but uh, anything concerning grid infrastructure, we are interested. So electrification of end markets is the broad bucket, but we are also looking at uh, digitization also. So there's also a bunch of software enterprise software investments in the portfolio. Uh, I think we are deploying something like uh, 75 million a year, uh, but a very independent uh, fund, if you will, uh, but associated with National Grid. Great. Thank you very much. And you mentioned you're deploying about $70 million. Did I hear that correctly? Great. Wonderful. So just a quick um, uh, conversation with the audience. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Can you guys raise that? So a significant majority of you are. Any investors in the crowd? Great. And you guys are angel investors, I take it? Is that fair to say? Perfect. And then who, anybody here from the press? No? Nope. We don't want to be press. We, do, we, should, we should get some more people here uh, so that they can spread the word. But that's great. I just wanted to get a sense about who the audience is so that we can try to you know, um, have the dialogue that we're having 
with a with a focus on 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 what you guys are here for. So let me. Um, Raghu, I want to ask a, a very broad question. We're, we're here to talk about climate tech, right? And you guys are doing some great investments, right? So I wanted to just define what climate tech is, and, and, and maybe climate tech may be just too limiting of a word for what you guys do. Because I think really what we're doing is, all of you are doing is, is energy technology investments. That's the way I kind of see it. But, but if you're... If you disagree with the with the with the nomenclature, please let's have a dialogue around around this topic to see what it is that you guys all cover. Yeah, this may be a little polarizing, but I, uh, or at least we are looking at it more as energy transition, uh, as the phrase to sort of pin our pin our coat on or uh, hang our hat on versus climate tech. Uh, maybe because there are uh, at least in the U.S. there are mandates against. Uh, doing climate investments, which is uh, which is an interesting way to look at it. Uh, but energy transition, energy security is the key uh, anchor around which we are investing. Uh, being a utility, uh, you know, we are kind of facing it, uh, facing the consequences of the changing mix of energy on the one side, on the supply side, and the usage side as well, uh, both on the demand side and supply side characteristics are drastically changing and the consequences of this changing mix and changing usage patterns are affecting the grid in a very drastic way. Uh, so we're trying to sort of take an option into the future for that changing landscape. So energy transition more than uh, climate tech. And since, since you're a UK investor, here in Silicon Valley and in the Northeast US, as mentioned, both in California and the Northeast US. Um, we're getting some interference here, but I think they're just trying to, you know, fine tune the, the voice here. Um, what What is the difference between what's going on in the UK and the US? Is there a difference? Is the focus different? And then we'll use this as a, as a springboard to Zoe and others. Uh, in many ways, uh, the uh, maybe not UK, but the broader European uh, ecosystem is different in the sense they've uh, faced the consequences of the energy transition thing much earlier, uh, both geopolitically and which has become a reality in the last, say, uh, few years. Uh, but they've they've had access to a different mix of energy. Uh, so they've been on the transition pathway much sooner than, in many ways, much sooner than the, than the U.S., but uh, the U.S. is much more technology leveraged and uh, uh, in many ways access to technologies are uh, much better in the U.S. and capital markets are, of course, much, much, much uh, mature here. Yep. So yeah, we, I please. would agree. Uh, there's plenty of innovation, but a lot less money in the UK, um, and and there is also a lot less of here where you might get two Stanford graduates who've written an idea on a napkin and they're like, this is worth $20 million and we're going to raise money accordingly, while in the UK they're like, oh, we've been trading for four years and we're making a million a year and we're valuing it at like a buck. Um, so there's, there's a, perhaps... Uh, uh, there's no limit on on uh, on their dreams, but they they have fewer resources to make it happen. Um, I will say also that the transition there is um, further along. I to agree with that. Just for some numbers, there are several major European countries that ran on more than 50% renewable energy last year. It is patriotic in in Europe now. Most countries to be doing whatever it takes to get off Russian gas. Um, in the same way that there's a weird sort of climate movement in the U.S. that's kind of a, really a screw China movement, um, where you see even a Republican senator putting a, a bill. Um, I mean, it's not going to pass, but it's just a sort of sign of the zeitgeist. Senator Cassidy had a bill that was, a, let's put a carbon tariff on Chinese goods. And I don't think many people in his party care a great deal about the climate, but they do care about um, the geopolitics of it. Um, whereas in Europe, it's more of a, of a, a screw Russia uh, a policy. Um, but so I would say in the U.S., there's, yeah, there's a lot more money. Um, there's probably more optimism, but there's also actual climate deniers in charge in some parts of the U.S., which um, not so much the case in the U.K. Like, I, I've never met a self-identified conservative in the U.K. who doesn't believe it's happening. I would say they're not worried enough, the, the whole population on the, on the whole. Like, I think people haven't grasped how bad it could get, how quickly, although they are certainly starting to because 
everybody's holiday in Sicily was ruined last summer because it was 110 Fahrenheit. And they're all like, oh my God, this thing is real. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, we were telling you that the whole time. So I would say that the conversation socially is a lot further. Um, the innovation is probably about the same, but the, uh, the investment is much higher over here. That's, that's great. Uh, Jordan, um, I, I, it's amazing that you guys have done 50 investments in you know, new investments last year. That's amazing. It's slated to do the same year. You know, most of Silicon Valley venture was triaging their deals, and, and you guys play a little bit in a different kind of a space. So we'd love to hear your perspective about you know, what you invested in, in terms of categories, if there is such a way of categorizing last year. Because I think in a down market, you know, people who invest in the down market and, 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 and double down on them are usually the ones that win in the long run. So love to hear your perspective about how you guys managed 50 investments and, and what categories they were in. Uh, so thank you for this. Uh, just a comment. Uh, the market is not down. Uh, 21 and 22 were crazy years, insane. Uh, irrational exuberance, like Alan Greenspan said. Right. If you look at the numbers of 23 and 22 and compare them to 19 and 18, they were not that bad. They were at par. We're normalizing. In 2023, the United States VCs and investors put $1,000 million of investments every month in seed and series A, a billion dollars. Yep. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's not $3 billion like it was 22 and 21, but it's still a lot of money. So the market, the trend is down compared to the two prior years. But if you look at the trajectory from 2012 all the way up to 2023, still going up. Great. Yep. I agree. <laughs> so what, you're we do, what we do is we follow on the VC's uh, investment thesis. So we identify specific VC's we like, and we work with very closely, and then we, we close the deals. We take the last half a million, the last 200K, the last 300K, and we expedite the process because we literally, with the bird that's sitting on top of the hippo, we just take whatever is left over from the deals and we accelerate the process in a way that would make sense to the founders as well as to us. We make, look at a ton of deals. We're still at a 5% conversion. For every 100 we look at, we invest in five. So we probably looked at four or 500 last year only, easily. So that's one. The second one is we're very concise. We know what we want. We know what we like. We know what we don't like. We know when to say no quickly and when to say yes quickly, and we just process this. It's not a factory, but it's somewhat. Uh, so so what, what is it you don't like? No Mickey Mouse stuff. <laughs> because it's, it's an interesting. We know what we like. We no, know what silly, we like. no silly stuff. We do B2B, B2B2C. B2 uh, enterprise software is our preference. Um, I like uh, companies with two founders. Um, I like companies with founders that have had six, seven, eight, nine years of experience, not in startups, but in real life. And I like uh, companies who have generated some revenue. So it's not a science experiment anymore. It's becoming a bit more real. And also founders who have identified the right VCs to partner with. Right. Because uh, th this journey isn't about just capital. Great. You know, um, and maybe Nari can, can you know, uh, pick up the conversation on what we like and what we don't like as venture capitalists, because that's a very interesting con concept. Because if you ask, you know, some people, they say, I, I, don't, I forget which one it was. I don't know if it was Mayfield that loved market and Sequoia loved people or vice versa, you know? <laughs> so it's interesting to kind of see what your perspective, because I know you guys do early stage deals. And, and, and what is it that entices you to do investments in this, in this, and maybe climate tech is a little bit different than some of the other fields, but if you feel it's not, I would love to hear your perspective. Actually, climate tech isn't very different from other areas. We look at same things other areas look, um, look at. The team, they gotta be strong, um, as he was saying. Um, can't be a science experiment, Co completely agree. Um, it, if it's a science experiment, it has to go back to the lab. Um, do it somewhere else, not with BC money. Um, so we're looking for an engineering problem, something that is just needs to scale up. Um, another area, uh, there has to be a market for it. So the market size has to be big, same as any software product that we've seen. Uh, market has to be big. We would like to see some commercial traction, some letters of intents of sales that they can potentially do. Um, 
What else? Uh, we do, we personally, our firm looks at um, how much uh, impact they can have on the environment. So we look at their greenhouse gas uh, potential for reducing emissions. They don't have to have direct reduction, but have to enable that um, reduction in some way. So it could be a software product that's helping renewables in some form or a grid and a grid technology, for example. Um, that, that covers the main areas. Um, competition, if it's a highly competitive market, you better stand out. You have to have a very differentiating factor. Um, yeah. So uh, let, me, let me play the devil's advocate a little bit and probe you. Sure. So if you had the market or the team, which one would you pick? It has to be both. <laughs> it can't be. If it were the difference between the two of them. Um, market. You if it's, the, the market. market's not big enough, we can't invest. You we can't, have to, yeah. has to be venture scalable and it has to return our fund. Interesting. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to kind of probe this a little bit. Uh, San, Sanjay, but, but, just. But, but the team cannot reach the market if the market is huge. So the team's still more important. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and, you, know, <laughs> and you know where I'm yeah. said both. On the question on team versus market, <clears throat> you remind me of uh, Don Valentine's YouTube video. Uh, I, I used to watch it uh, seven, eight years ago. He used to talk, he talked about uh, should you focus on team. Don was the co-founder or founder of Sequoia Capital, yes. for you guys who don't know. Um, and he said, we learn the hard way, you can replace the team, you cannot change the markets. That's his viewpoint. Okay. I'm not sure if I agree, but, yeah. but that's his viewpoint. He said markets first, absolutely. So let me tell you what the reason I actually asked this question. Um, is that you, you can get it wrong, right? When you guys are doing the investments, the investment thesis, things can go wrong, things can change, regulatory landscape can change, right? And I will always take the other side. I will take the team. Because I think if you have the right team, they, they will be able to figure it out when things change that is outside of their control. And that's why, because market, and we've seen it happen, right? I mean, I've been doing this since, since the 90s, right? Many sides of the market changed over the last 30 years. And, you know, but you had founders like, you know, the folks at Google and the folks at different places where they really changed their business plan completely and became something different and because of the team. So th that's why I was probing you with a question, but I hear the answer. I mean, it's, it's a hard one to answer. But Sanjeev, I was going to ask you something, and I'll come back to you, uh, Zoe. I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an enticing question and it requires a de debate. What are the models for, uh, for the climate tech, or really called energy technologies? I think that's the better you know, sector. Are there, dif are, they different? are there differences between the, what a hot company business model has in the energy tech sector versus a software tech sector? Do you, do you see the, that there is a distinction between the two? Yeah, so there are, so the way we look at energy and climate tech sector, we actually break it down into two subsectors. So one is software driven climate tech. Right. Second is I would say, for lack of a better word, traditional climate tech innovation. In software-driven climate tech, as an example, there are companies that are doing data analysis using weather pattern data or other publicly available data or traffic data, et cetera, and then predicting what's gonna happen in the next few days in your area beyond what you get today from weather reports. Right, so that's that's one use case of software-driven climate tech, and obviously AI, which is a big sector of investment for us. Within AI, climate tech, we are seeing it as an emerging hotspot as a use case, as a vertical of focus, and I, I believe that will actually grow. It's somehow not being talked about much in the media. I actually think AI-driven climate tech innovation is only going to grow in the next couple of years. So in those, the business model remains the same as a traditional data analytics software company or an AI-driven software company. Lot of them, lot of these climate tech companies are, since they are data-driven, they are all hosted on either AWS or Azure, and their stack looks like a traditional software SaaS company, if I may say. For the non-software driven, that's call it the traditional climate tech, 
uh, innovation, uh, companies driving that, if that part of the innovation in climate tech, the business model becomes a little different. We have seen, uh, and, and again, the devil is in the details, if you're going after, let's say, um, alternates to meet. Me, every, I, I forget the uh, numbers, every, for every, I don't know, kilograms of beef, we are emitting 50 to 100 kilograms of CO2. Chicken and pork are better, but not quite there. So the, we are in a meat tsunami all, uh, at, at a world, at a global level. So there are startups that are trying to solve that problem whether it is high protein diet or whether it is other food. So their business model is totally different, as you can imagine, right? So their business model probably looks like a beyond meat kind of a business model, right? So, and then secondly, another example to uh, bring it closer to home is you can put sensors around you, whether it is an industrial environment or whether it is even a home environment. I can, there are enough startups out there that will help you monitor your energy usage by planting sensors around your home or, or onto devices like HVAC, et cetera, and then giving you visibility into what energy usage is happening, what time, which device, et cetera. So you can not just monitor it, but control it and improve it as well. So their business model is a mix of hardware and software. Now they do try to sell themselves as, hey, hardware as a service, or I will charge subscription based business model fees. I think it doesn't work in my humble opinion. You, they, those should just stick to saying, hey, here is the hardware, here is the software part. You do have to pay for the hardware. So I hope that helps address the question on different, a variety of business models within climate tech. I can go on. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. It's a, the topic is big, and there could be lots of discussion around these things, but thank you for giving us some of the synopsis of these things. So, uh, Nari, back to you, if I may. Um, how does the regulatory landscape and the stuff that's going on in the Senate right now and the bills that are being passed or not passed and changing around, how does that affect your thesis on investment? Do you, do you actually you know, think about these things when you're when you're doing the investments and looking at the regulatory landscape and what's, what's about to come up. I would love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, sure. Um, for example, the IRA, there's a lot of tax credits that they're now allowing yep. hydrogen being one big area. It doesn't really change our thesis that much, but we do see it as a, a tailwind for those companies. So it is, it's like a, a boost, a tailwind. Um, that means that those companies that do have these tailwinds need to take advantage of it and move as quickly as possible. But when we're looking at companies, they have to be on the path for profitability with or without those tax credits, because especially in the US, that could change very quickly. Yep. Europe is a bit more stable, but you know, in the US, we, we just don't know how much this good time will last. So we're very careful about not depending on a tax credit, for example, to make an investment. Okay. Yep. Add go ahead, Zoe. Go ahead, please. To, to that, which is that, yeah, we also look at something. Yeah, um, we also will say basically, if we're going to be in business with someone, you know, because we're dealing with early stage companies, if we might be working with you for ten or twelve years, um, then that's three election cycles. So you can't be too too vulnerable to that sort of thing. Um, having said that, I agree that the the IRA is a wonderful tailwind. It's also creating a constituency for. Um, not abolishing it because, uh, for example, Form Energy just put 850 jobs in West Virginia um, on the site of an old iron uh, works of some sort. And, um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's very rapidly, like the most two most uh, fastest growing jobs in America right now are solar panel installer and wind type turbine technician. So I think there's going to be a constituency that will make it a little more stable, even if the election um, is perhaps doesn't go in the most climate friendly direction. Right. Uh, Jordan, we didn't mean to pass you by here. You know, some of the, um, and I know that you guys are, have been investing in for some time now in these early stage companies in the climate tech. Have any of them grown to be, become larger companies and you would like to kind of like make a mention about them and note what, what they're doing and, and, and what you think would be a hot company in your portfolio or at least one or two of them? I'll tell you about the ones we're looking at. Okay. Because the ones we invested in, we don't care. I think your voice is off. You want to try turning it on and off? Testing, all? test. There's a button here. 
Yeah, oh, you said much to you then. <laughs> yeah, pink is the answer. I'll, um, I'll, I'll share with you uh, companies we're examining and looking at because the, the, the future is what we look for. What we invested in is doing well, um, but we're looking at uh, two companies. One is um, it's a biotech company. They are using uh, AI to create new chemistry. A company is called Progeny. Progeny. She's uh, they're coming out of Israel. Um, they're looking at uh, the compounds with the magnetic resonance and creating new chemistry to provide better herbicides to combat herbicide resistance, weeds and what have. It's gone now. That's going to help with the produce and the yields and what have you. And they can do other things. It's not climate change. Right. It's not ag tech but the utility of what they do can lend itself to that component. Great. So that's one, com one, one company we're looking at. Um, another company we're looking at, uh, they take flies, they do some DNA work, they grab some material out of that, and then they ferment it into larger compounds that is used in a wide range of applications. One of them is improving the hair coloring. So instead of using formaldehyde, they're using that elastic material to create better hair coloring. And with that, there's a lot less reduction in pollution and blah, 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 blah. So to me, climate change isn't just climate, climate, climate. Right. It's death with a thousand cuts. So he mentioned sensors, and she spoke about regulation. So there's not just, there isn't a climate tech company per se. Right. Yeah, most of what I like to is, software, like my good friend on the other side who does not like pink, that helps enterprise class solutions solve the climate situation and make capital gains. Right. I hope that helps. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much. It's great to hear some of these things because the nice thing about them, they're outside of what people think climate tech is, you know? So it's nice to kind of have perspectives around these things. Zoe, you've been scribbling things down right, left, and center every question. So I, Please pitch in you know, as the discussion is going on. Don't mean, feel like it has to be your turn to talk. But I know that on the regulatory side, you had some thoughts about the, on the discussion. But on the company side, uh, can you tell us about a few of the companies that you guys have invested in? Yeah. Because it sounds like you also are doing some food technologies. Am I correct? Uh, yes, we, uh, so we do. So it would be have... great to hear about those as well. Yeah, we've invested in a company called Ruminate, which you may have heard about because Breakthrough is um, invested in it, which is Bill Gates. And uh, this is, um, so pe people have probably heard about how when cows eat food, they don't digest it fully, which creates methane. And so you'll see the headlines, cow burps, destroying the planet. And it's actually true. Um, and our theory is basically people are not going to stop eating beef, although ideally, um, of course, I'm sure everyone in this room has already uh, stopped eating beef. But um, what if we could make beef maybe a little bit less harmful? And so, uh, that, you know, you've probably heard again about seaweed being fed to cows. Um, the problem with that is that the seaweed, it, it takes a long time to grow and uh, cows actually don't like it very much. And also cows do not live in the sea. So, um, fun, fun fact. Um, so you take the uh, the uh, bromoform, which is the active ingredient, the thing that's uh, making uh, making the methane get, well, making the food get fully digested, therefore the methane doesn't get produced and they've turned it into a slow release uh, bolus that the cow can take once or twice a year and that makes it not produce any or it eliminates at the moment about 90 percent of the methane and if you're the farmer that's great news because if the cow's digesting the food more efficiently you need about 12 percent less food which means uh, the single biggest expense in your um, in your farm has now gone down so we're very interested in food waste as well because you know 30 or 40 percent of food in the us is uh, uh, is wasted it's a very localized problem because you'll see in different countries, people have a very different, you know, that in, in uh, you know, lower and middle income countries, if they've got food in the house, they'll eat it and they don't waste it and they don't not eat the leftovers and things like that. So the waste there tends to happen before the farm gate where the farmers can't get it to the right market, whereas here the waste happens at the supermarket or in the home. So we're looking at different solutions in different places. Um, but I think food, land and agriculture as a climate bucket for us is in some ways the most challenging, but in other ways the most rewarding, because I think a lot of what has gone wrong in our relationship, like what has caused climate change in the first place um, or allowed us to let this happen is that our relationship with the world and our food is, is really messed up. And the stuff that a lot of us eat a lot of the time really isn't, it's not really food, it has no nutritional value. So um, there's also a very large number of green consumers, people who want to eat beyond meat, who want to eat more plants, who want to have, 
um, have better options. And I also think there's an argument that it is a right that everybody should be able to go into a shop and eat, you know, buy uh, affordable, decent, uh, healthy, healthy food. Um, it would also eliminate a huge swath of the climate problem and um, maybe make the world slightly nicer. Fantastic. And uh, Raghu, please talk about a couple of the companies that you guys have invested in yeah, so, that you think will be... Yeah, so I think one third of the portfolio is just uh, enterprise software, uh, including cybersecurity. This is critical infrastructure, so you have state actors uh, trying to hack the infrastructure. So there is uh, uh, both IT and OT security, if you will. So very traditional enterprise software, but with uh, application into uh, something like a grid. Um, and then there is uh, grid scale storage um, um, because of the whole uh, uh, changing mix that we initially mentioned. Uh, uh, there is a company that does um, demand response. Uh, so it's like a marketplace for uh, um, um, you know demand response basically where uh, uh, you get incentives to reduce your usage on the uh, on the demand side and on the supply side uh, as uh, uh, when you have these peak um, peak demand uh, situations during summer uh, they send out uh, uh, incentives to shave some of the some of the demand so there's, there's a marketplace to do that um, and then there is uh, uh, EV infrastructure uh, companies that uh, optimize for electrification of transportation, which has significant grid consequences. So, great, but Nari, if you would please tell us a couple of, of your companies. Yeah, sure. Well, one of the companies we're investing in is called Lid Lydian Labs. Uh, they take CO2 and are able to produce sustainable aviation fuel. So that's one of the the big ones that is removing CO2. Uh, another one uh, we've invested in, uh, they have microbes that go into the soil. They take CO2 from the atmosphere and convert that CO2 into nutrients for the soil. So the farmers, um, it actually improves the health of the soil and they can sell those carbon credits to companies who want to um, participate in those markets. Um, another example of a company we've invested in is doing um, ultra um, fast computing chips, um, so they ha they're very efficient. They're meant to go into directly into data centers and reduce the energy consumption of these very high energy intense places to much, and bring them down much, to much lower uh, energy consumption. That's great. Sanjit, your turn. Love to hear about a couple of the companies that you guys have invested in. So a um, couple of companies that are going after energy and climate tech using data and uh, AI, obviously, uh, OpenAI is doing actually a lot of work in that, so you uh, probably can read it online as well. But they're creating uh, specific uh, uh, versions of their model for climate and energy use cases. That's one. We invested in a company called Cornami that is creating new chips that should go into for that should help towards energy saving as well as well as uh, security use cases. So our thesis for climate tech is more from use of uh, some of these technologies like uh, data analytics, et cetera, and using, and then going after climate tech as one of the verticals. Great, thank you. You know, then um, I, we have a few minutes left and I wanted to just talk about some of the funding of these companies because, you know, in the, 2007, 2008 timeframe, everybody started investing in these, you know, energy technology companies, and then they soon realized that there's way too much capital is required to bring these some of these companies to commercializations, whether it was in biofuels or algae or grid technologies in that respect. And I remember that we actually sold a couple of the grid technologies off because, but in reasonable prices, before the market turned down. So the question I have is really. Have things changed? Have have other investors stepped in? And uh, and uh, Zoe, maybe we start with Zoe if you don't mind, Raghu. But please go ahead, you, because you guys are early stage investors. Uh, yes, things have changed. I think anyone that was doing climate before 2020 should get like an official T-shirt that says they were cooling the planet before it was cool. Um, but now <laughs> we are in a huge pivot, which is basically every time half of someone's country burns down, people realize that this matters and they start uh, paying attention. 
Um, also, the cost of solar has dropped by 90% in the last 10 years. So, you know, that the period you're referring to, which is known as clean tech one, um, was, you know, a lot of people got burned, a lot of people lost a lot of money. Um, I think people are now realizing, firstly, that we do not have time to have clean tech to fail and then wait another 20 years and then do it again. Like we either win this fight in the next 15 to 20 years or our grandchildren are going to have a very reduced uh, civilization. So that's changed. And then the amount of money has changed and also the amount of information and innovation. I mean, it's just incredible. Like I meet people who are doing soil measurement, which is going to reduce the amount of fertilizer. You meet people who are turning banana stems into cotton and it could displace 10% of the textiles, um, the high, high carbon, you know, textiles is a terrible industry um, and they could just make a waste product into t-shirts. You, you meet people who are doing all kinds of things and a lot of that technology, just the compute power wasn't there um, and the connections weren't there. And I think there's also a huge change of, um, it's a lot, uh, there's just a lot more innovation that we can now connect capital to innovation in places like Kenya and Indonesia and India. And there's all these really exciting companies coming out of places that perhaps Silicon Valley might have been a little snooty towards in, in the past, um, just a smidge. Um, and, and now, you know, people are keep making the effort to sort of go to Mumbai and, and meet everybody and, and connect those, those uh, to connect the talent to the opportunity. Yeah, uh, Jordan and Nari, please. Uh, I would love to hear your perspectives on the on the new innovation cycle and how things are kind of moving and the juxtaposition to the, you know, climate tech or energy tech 1.0. They are, and they are uh, for many reasons. Uh, uh, Zoe mentioned a, a pattern, a behavior, where the masses are doing things to improve climate, whether it's for capital gains purposes or survival purposes. Now, access to capital is improved. Countries and people at all levels of society can access capital. Not like we want to, but trust me, they can get to it. Um, the, the level of iteration I'm seeing is the information management related to climate and processing and, and, and is allowing better innovation in terms of finding better solutions. The other component is this VC business, the Silicon Valley business, is enabling a lot of brilliant people to think, I could do this too. And I want to do it because I want to feel good about myself and my grandkids, not because I just want to make money. As far as the venture space, it's gone substantially higher on, on, on the climate because there's a lot of money to be made there. Tremendous amount of money, obscene amount of money. So in all fronts, it's positive. If you look at uh, MBA from Stanford or Ivy League, they're going to say I'm BSing. But the end of the day is VC is all about making money. And climate is a necessity. If you don't have it, we don't have, we don't have a chart at it. So everybody's going that direction. Right. And then, uh, Nari, this may be the last question. So uh, it's yours to get and uh, hit it out of the ballpark, <laughs> so to say. I want to talk about the international arena and what is happening in the international arena with some of your portfolio companies that may be looking to grow outside the United States and whether or not that focus in the energy technologies market is really a still, you know, is, is it something that's on the primary mind of these folks? Because you're talking about the market, because there's also the international markets and the US markets, or is the international markets really secondary right now for most early stage companies? Uh, for most of our portfolio companies, they are trying to expand internationally. Generally, it's more a stepwise expansion. So establish yourself in the U.S. first or maybe Europe if that's their home base and then switch. So we see um, U.S. companies going to Europe, European companies expanding to the U.S. After that, then they're moving into other markets. Um, for most of our companies, they're very early stage. So these expansions haven't happened, but those are the the stepwise steps that they would take. The other thing that we're seeing is that your innovation or your team might be in the US, but your product might be deployed in, let's say, a mine in Chile. So that's still something we're investing in, and that's an international um, scope, so to say. Right. And, you know, maybe Raghu, you can speak to that since you do you know, work with a venture capital fund that is yeah. actually so maybe, maybe an international this is, footprint. This is a little controversial, but. Uh, uh, at least what we are seeing is it's less of disruption and more of transition because uh, especially in energy transition, you have legacy industries that have to adopt a lot of these uh, technologies, products, you know, customers and whatnot and transition from 
what they've been doing for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, so you're not going to go in and disrupt this uh, incumbent in uh, even in a decade. So you know it goes back to the initial point that uh, there's a lot more uh, uh, corporates that are getting active. Uh, so Europe's a great example: transportation, ocean. I mean, these are industries that have. Uh, been there for a long time. Uh, even wind and wind and uh, uh, offshore wind and other a bunch of other end markets. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We are at the end of our panel discussion. We'll hand the baton over to over to Rob again. And thank you so much for for the panel for the you know for the f fabulous team that you put up here. Okay, but well, we're not done yet. <laughs> well, you exceeded expectations, and uh, thank you for uh, adjusting the time. So let's give it up for our panel. So now it's time for audience participation. Uh, if you have a question for our panel, step up to the mic, ask away. This is not a pitch event, so do not deliver a pitch or a thinly disguised pitch. If you deliver a pitch or a thinly disguised pitch, you will have to deal with Joe, our bouncer. Uh, enough said. So first question. Bert. Thank you. <clears throat> Bert Wang and Finirel, we're exhibiting outside. Question, the clean tech 2.0 lesson learned, it takes long time. What strategy does this impact your fund? Are you looking at 15-year funds? Are you making sure there's fresher funds that you can invest in early? What's your strategy for the, the still truth? Things take a long time in clean tech. So let me let me just take a lead on that, and then I'll pass it on to whoever wants to. Yeah, I think the question is in terms of the length of time it takes to do these investments and commercialize these products, and the the financing that may be available for these things. Where how does it go from the early stage to the second stage to the commercialization stage, and which entities are behind them, and how does the cycle actually work? So. Um, um, Nari, I mean, I think I think you guys have a lot of early stage companies. Zoe, what are your perspectives? Where do you you guys are doing the pre or seed or yeah, a little bit post seed or series pre series A, yeah. a however you want to call it, or series A? Where do you think the money is going to come for series B? And Zoe, you, you could you know follow up with that too. Uh, to answer your question, um, our firm has a ten year. Uh, fund. Um, I've seen other VCs that generally also do 10 years or up to 15 years. Um, so the money, when we are investing, we are investing with that plan that those revenues will come at those five to 10 year mark. We'll be seeing those come through. Um, and yeah, what was the question? Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and to, to just give, kick this off. So, so what Nari is saying is that the funds are usually 10 year funds and they usually have an investment cycle of four years or so. So they will they will do their investments, the first stage investment, the first four, sometimes five years. So they really have, even for the latest one, a five-year timeline to harvest, right? That's that's kind of where you were getting at with the 10-year fund. But the right, they'll, is, they'll make revenue somewhere in five years or so, and a five to 10 years, they'll make revenue and then some kind of exit. And then we're an early stage fund, so when they're past Series A, we're working with later uh, multi-stage funds to help them get to the series B's and C's. And I think that's the focus. The focus yeah. is really the question is, who are these multi-stage funds? Do we do the entrepreneurs rely on you to get this, to get them over to the multi-stage fund? Do they have to go chase the multi-stage funds and know what the next step is? And uh, you and Zoe can... can, can sure, pick. I can answer first. Um, it's both. The Entrepreneurs always have to chase after their own funds, but we help, will help them. We have partnerships. We have connections. We will always help our founders. Um, Lower Carbon is one really big climate fund that they do multi-stage, and we also have um, friends and connections in the big big names, um, Coastal Ventures, um, you name it. We also we help that with, help with that. Also, if it's going well, the big funds start coming to us or coming to them. So that's always nice when you don't have to go and hunt them. Um, um, so I would say for us, like timeline wise, yeah, similar 10-year ten, ten fund. Um, and um, and the reason the funds normally work over four years is that what happens to the, the management fee after that is, <laughs> you know, everybody goes home. Um, so um, so it, it does depend if it's a SaaS 
company, then obviously it can do like a hockey stick. Um, whereas if it's like metals recycling and you have to put steel in the ground and you have to go to a mine and you have to build a solar array to have enough energy, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that's more likely to have a longer timeline. Um, and also where you might be uh, later on looking at more like a project uh, based you know, project finance or, or you might be looking at debt and that kind of other options. Um, and so it's certainly our job to make sure that those relationships are in place before uh, the companies have to ask for them, because you don't want to be asking someone for money the first day that you meet them. That's considered impolite. And, and then, and then, there are people like Ragu out there. You know, there's Ragu's fund is one of the funds. The CVCs, the corporate venture capital, is playing a significant role in these. You know, in in commercialization and advancement of these these uh, these. Uh, Energy, you know, There's also energy tech companies. things like the, the DOE and other government type funding and non dilutive funding that can come along um, at, at all kinds of wonderful and surprising stages. I mean, Climeworks is getting $600 million, uh, some of which is coming from the government down in Louisiana. And then on the DOE grants and all these other grants that are available, that's something that the company will do throughout their entire cycle. They will keep on writing these grants to get these additional monies that are non dilutive money. But the corporate venture capital, especially in the energy technology, has really stepped in. There's uh, the the grid fund that uh, Ragu is involved in. There is Schneider Electric. There is, you know, SK Telecom. I mean, there's many of these companies, and some of them are OUS, outside U.S. entities that have actually stepped in. As we're present on the panel, as the U.K. entity that is a corporate venture capital. So hopefully that answers your question. Great. Next, do you have a metric? Uh, for how much revenue is generated per ton of CO2 reduced. We've done something like that just recently, I think, mentioning uh, BEV, and uh, we came up with our own metric for per CO2, per CO2, a ton of CO2 uh, reduced, how much uh, revenue. Do you have something like that that you're working off of? Yeah, we have a metric. Um, I forget the exact number, but we're looking for, as a whole portfolio, an X amount of CO2 um, removed. Um, so if you're, let's say, a software company, it's okay because it would even out across our whole portfolio. But generally, yes, if you are removing CO2, it should be a, a high amount. Thank you. Next, go ahead. So, can you hear me okay? This is a weird mic. I'll yell. Can yeah, you hear me now? Please, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. That okay, works. So I'm a, foren a retired forensic toxicologist. And when I hear about new technology, the first thing I think about is the unintended consequences. So as investors, do you look at the, safe, the health and safety aspects of new technology in climate tech? I'm not a climate tech person, but I'm in the We can't room. hear you. Oh. Uh, get really close and yell. Okay. I'm good. Can I just repeat the question? I, I can repeat the question. Yeah, I can say it again. Oh, Zoe. All right. Um, so the question was, uh, we have here a, a retired forensic toxicologist and who hears new technology and goes to, uh, this is scene one of a supervillain origin, that, that sort of okay. thing. No, um, and, oh, I knew it's uh, and, and do we worry about unintended consequences? Absolutely. Hell yes, we do. Um, because... Uh, you know, the, the, you don't want the, the situation where today's solution is tomorrow's millstone. If I discovered in my later life that I had helped create microplastic, like whatever's next and worse than that, I would be like, oh my God, I, I need to, you know, that, that I, I'd be sending myself straight to hell. So yes, absolutely. Um, and also because the whole point of moving to a circular economy is that materials will start and, and will start to th change our relationship with stuff and change our relationship with the way that we think of a high quality life and the way that we think of, of what money is even for. So you absolutely need to think of that. You also need to think of, uh, you know, the human rights implications. Like if we're building a green transition that heavily depends on cobalt, which is mined under totally barbaric conditions in Congo by children, um, we need to also worry about that. But I will say that um, climate change is itself an unintended consequence. We have already done geoengineering. Um, you know, people didn't start digging coal and oil out of the ground 150 years ago because they were like, ha ha, and then our great grandchildren will have a terrible, you know, their holiday will be ruined by a wildfire. Like they, they, this wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so if we don't start thinking about that, we're going to unleash the next Godzilla. So yes. I mean, I'm talking specifically about chemicals that can impact one's ability to absorb nutrients and that can have an impact on health, which will then impact climate. I, 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 think I goes totally agree. And if it's not PFAS free, I don't want to hear about it. So absolutely. 
If it's not PFAS free, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. Question. Do you yes. think anybody who's being recorded is going to say, we don't worry about unintended consequences? We, we, we shouldn't say it because then we can be held accountable for having said it later. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, I, I just generally speaking, any investor, most investors, all investors are not going to say, yeah, I don't care if this blows up the world. It's not like that. Right. But uh, the EVs, the best thing in the world. Now, EVs are creating a power grid problem. Who would have thought that? So there's always something that happens. And we as humans, we are very talented at destroying the earth. We just have to know how far we look out before we say, all right, I'm going to stop worrying beyond that point. That's all I'm trying to say. This is a great ethics question that's going on with the climate tech. I think it's going on everywhere. I mean, EVs are fabulous. You know, it's solving some of the problems that we're having with the, with the atmosphere. But, but, you know, mining the cobalt in the Congo Republic and, you know, all the materials that need to go back and get deposited somewhere. And so the toxicity that this nice lady was talking about that that really is endemic in some of the stuff that's going on it is it is part and parcel of technological you know evolution unfortunately you know so um no, none of us is going to say yeah i don't care i mean I no mean, we, we care i mean everybody's going to say we care and we hope to kind of figure out some other solution for the you know less than positive byproducts of all these technical technological evolutions you know such as the industrial revolution and created all the mess that we that they lived through for you know a, a century so um but it's a great topic it's a great discussion item uh, it won't change i think the pace of the evolution of technology you know we just realized that we have some real negative aspects of each of these things that we just have to deal with over time yeah but but we also have question. to include like more more communities and more, this is, you know, the industrial revolution drove a lot of wealth to people like the Rockefellers, but for the first hundred years, the average worker really didn't see a lot of benefits from it. Like they lived in appalling conditions. In this case, we should actually you know, be making sure solutions are coming from different communities and a more diverse people get to actually have a seat at the table and say, actually, we can't do it like that because, you know, cobalt yeah. mines, et cetera. And that will help it to not hurt people in the future. Uh, we're becoming like a Stanford, you know, PhD kind of a seminar <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that the, the, the great thing about what goes on in Silicon Valley is that all of these problems will eventually somebody will think about them and try to come up with a solution about them. You know, and, and that's the the beauty of what, you know, this sector is has been doing for now a long time. But let's go to the next lady there. Thank go you. Ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Clear. My name is Preeti Padmanabhan. I'm Hello. a GTM leader and I also do angel investing, a couple of investments in clean tech. Uh, my question is about the in government incentives, right? Uh, because some of the startups I'm involved in are dependent on like in incentives, that incentives for solar, for charging stations, etc. I'd love to understand your viewpoints on how the political landscape might impact those in incentives. Right. Uh, Raghu, you've been quiet for the last yeah, few yeah. minutes, but go ahead, S repeat your question yeah. one more time. Yeah, no, we heard you, but I think it's it's interesting to to settle. Just oh. the question alone, yeah. So the question was, uh, there are incentives that the government is giving, which is actually pretty good. Uh, how does the political landscape and any changes in the coming year might change the incentives, or do you see that happening, or will it be protected enough that you know, there's enough momentum that the political changes or anything will not impact the incentives? Yeah, I think. Maybe this goes back to the thesis. Uh, um, we are looking at it from a non-subsidized uh, uh, cost of uh, a technology. So if the subsidy is going towards uh, de-risking technology, it's a different uh, piece of the puzzle. If, but if the subsidy is going towards changing <laughs> the economics of running a plant, it's a very different. Uh, that's something that we try not to uh, you know, sort of get involved in, meaning we want the uh, not just the technology, but we want the business model to compete with uh, whatever the incumbent business model is without subsidies. I don't know if that, that's, yeah, because the... Being independent of the subsidies. Yeah, be, simply because, uh, you know, every government's change, priorities change, and it's actually much more, uh, I think, much more of a 
competitive landscape if you know somebody artificially doesn't pick winners and lets the marketplace pick the winners because we want the most efficient solution to win right and we don't know what that is until they compete with each other uh, jordan please do, do, and, and also sanjeet i think you may have some something to add to it so please go ahead jordan so in the context of angel investment don't put it in the equation, don't think about it, don't consider it, don't even make it a factor. Example, we passed a huge uh, bill called the CHIPS Act bill, and 90-some percent of that money hasn't been deployed for many reasons. Not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So uh, those who thought, I'm gonna invest in a chip company because there's a ton of money, in, that's not gonna happen for a couple of more years because there's so many things going on. So as an investor, especially early stage, we don't consider the politics, the changes, all of this into the mix, because at best, it'll be an injection of cash for a short period of time, and then it's gone. It's not fundamental to the success of the company. However, if the regulation is changing in a way that you will have to do this, and I'm solving a solution, I'm providing a solution to help you do this, that's a different conversation. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but if it's about money, take it out. If it's about behavior and rules and everything, put it back in. Well, my name is Sufyan Ajana. I'm a doctor in uh, epidemiology, and uh, I don't work on uh, on clean tech or like uh, <laughs> I think I mixed up conferences. But since I'm here, then <laughs> I just ask my question. Uh, well, I'm in deep tech, so my question is more like towards you, uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, you said that like you are interested in deep tech startups, right? Okay, so what I do basically, I come from the French NIH and I prevent blindness due to a disease called macular degeneration, or AMD. 20 million Americans have it. Um, you say that like you want a deep deck uh, technology, but also you, you want to see some revenue. How can you put both these words in the same sentence? Like, uh, to be able, like for me, for example, to be able to bring my technology to market, you know that I need to go through clinical trials, to have the FDA approval, it takes millions. Like I'm doing it right now, so like I know how expensive it is. Um, how can you expect it's <laughs> revenues a great question. in the wind that like I need millions to be able to do that? And you're investing in, in like uh, I, I guess if I didn't, um, if if I'm mistaken, like seed Series A. So like we're talking about like small investments. But this is a great question. I think I think we've got the and I'm, the reason I'm. I'm uh, stepping in is because we, we understand the question. You're expecting too much, Jordan. That's the question. Why do you want to expect so much? <laughs> Simple answer. Get over yourself. Get over what? Get over yourself. If you want to be in a business that's going to take years and years and years and create, uh, bring in millions of dollars, that's good. That's your deep tech. My deep tech is different. I like deep tech that gets to market and creates value in a couple of years. It doesn't have to be your stuff. It could be in electronics. It could be in data. It could be in a wide range of things that don't include yours. So besides the comment of get over yourself, you're not necessarily in the deep tech that I like, but she may be. So find the one that likes the deep tech that goes years and years and years before you produce results. Different investors have different models, and I'm not your model. So that's why I can put it in one sentence. Right, and you know, the, I think what's what's being said here is that you need to really focus on momentum for financing purposes when you come up with a concept and you want to deploy things. The commercial aspect of these things requires momentum. Momentum requires a big market. Momentum requires quick deployment. Momentum requires finding how to get a customer that's willing to pay for it so they can, in fact, say, yes, there is value to this technology that I'm willing to pay for. And once that is the case, then you have a whole host of people here that are willing to say, okay, if someone's willing to pay for the technology that you've developed, at that point in time, we are willing to invest in it. So you need to figure out how the step, steps of these things are to get to the momentum, to get to the market, to get to the sale, to show an investor that there is somebody there that believes that you have something of value that we're willing to part cash, cash for. Okay. Yesterday I was talking to an investor. They put $150 million just to get to an FDA approval. Right. That's good. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. But it's not for us. That's not what you do. <laughs> that may or may not be what you do. Next person, please. Thank you so much. Go ahead. All right, um, I'm a little bit new to the whole investment scene. Uh, we can't hear you. 
I've been a little bit new to the investment scene. I've been basically self-funding all my own businesses and just making revenue and profit with them. Um, we're, you're, you mentioned that you, you guys give out around like three hundred, five hundred thousand dollar checks, right? Or uh, everybody has a different number. In, in general, right? What what ROI would you like that return to you, and what time frame? Or Sanjit, go ahead. Um, most most VCs are uh, looking for at least ten x. Okay. Uh, in let's say five years, does it happen all the times? Yeah. But uh, they let's say they invest in ten companies. They expect one or two to be high flyers, and they, those will return the entire fund. Sometimes, m many times, manifold. They will expect two or three companies will die. Others may give two or three x return. So at a portfolio level, they can go back to their investors called limited partners and say, hey, we generated, a let's say, a 5x return for you in, in three to four years. So that is uh, something you can expect from VCs. Now, there are cases when, and we, we've seen this too, some company goes 40x, 50x, that's just crazy. You can't predict it, actually. You know, and the, the reality is at an early stage, when you're investing in seed stage, you're investing in a class of kindergartners. You don't know who's going to become Jeff Bezos. Uh, can I kind of get a little bit of follow-up to that? Yeah. What would you guys consider a seed stage if they're already making revenue and profit? That's my question. Um, revenue and profit, that is good. Uh, then you can call yourself maybe C, somewhere between seed and, depending on the level of revenue, maybe closer to series A. Yeah. Seed companies typically have first two customers maybe less than a million dollars in revenue okay what would be uh, after that i'm sorry what would be after that you have you already have that then you should look start looking at okay. post seed maybe series a all right awesome thank you sure i have a different answer for you <laughs> different investors have different metrics okay even the same investor within the same fund the early stages of the fund they want to have maximum multiples, 40, 50. Because they know at the tail end of it, they may not get the 40 and the 50. It's a law of averages. I want to hit 40 in here. I want to hit 25 in there. I'm okay to get a 10 in here. It's a big bet. So as you talk to and engage investors, sort out what is it they look for. You know, yeah. uh, yesterday I had a conversation with a VC. He says, I want 40 X. Why is that? Because I'm at the tail end of the fund. And I need to bring up my averages. Uh, okay. Because he's taken 10 X's and 25 X's and 20 X's. All right. So there is not one single answer for you. It's about understanding who your customer is, the investor, what they're looking for. And different customers have different expectations. Okay, thank you so much. And, 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 and you, you can go ahead and, and, and sit down and I'm going to talk about this as well. So there's the, there's the, you can go ahead and take your seat. Go ahead. Um, you know, there's also the, the concept of later stage investors who are not going to be expecting 40x or 30x or 50x. You know, the later stage investors will have more modest expectations of returns. As you know, Sanjit said and, and uh, Jordan amplified, the earlier stage investors do want to have a 10x return because that, is a, that sets the stage for some of the companies that are potentially going to be losers, you know, in their portfolio. So there'll be some that are 10, 20, 30x that will make up the the better. But later stage investors do not have those kinds of expectations. And later stage, I mean companies that really are investing when there's $10, $15 million of revenues already, a market that's been proven, the team that is together, and all the other stuff. But go ahead. What is your question? Okay. I'll make, I'll make it short. Can you hear me? Yes? yes. Okay. My name is Ajay. I'm a climate tech entrepreneur, and we do product carbon accounting. My question is... Uh, there are many verticals within climate tech, and in the past, people have been excited about different things, such as carbon accounting in 2021, or uh, direct air capture, or you know, plant-based meat. Yep. What are what is like one thing that each of you is excited about for 2024 in within climate tech? So, really, the question is, in terms of the different sectors within the climate tech or energy technology. And what about them again? What is your specific question about that? What are some of the bright spots? What, what are each of the investors here excited about in 2024? So I just, I'm trying to figure out what yeah. is being invested in within climate tech. So you know? let me narrow the question. So in 2024, this is out the current year, 
What are you guys looking at? Is, is there a specific sector within the energy technology, Zoe, that you're looking at? Um, or, or are you looking at it broadly? Go ahead. Um, I would say, it, by the way, in climate generally, energy and mobility are by far the best funded, um, although relative to, to, to their impact, I would say built environment, um, uh, agriculture and um, uh, industry are, are, are the least funded. I, I'm a little cynical on carbon markets. I think they need to mature. But I'm very gung-ho and excited about green industrial processes and things like green steel, green cement, because cement is 8% of the climate pie, like it's bigger than aviation and shipping put together. Um, so if somebody brought me my dream uh, green steel or green cement company, I would be very happy. Same. <laughs> Good. Okay, we have consensus. Maybe maybe one more to add. Uh, hydrogen is, uh, is interesting um, across the value chain especially because uh, some of these uh, end markets that was, uh, that was mentioned uh, are difficult to electrify. So you need alternatives than uh, purely electrification. So hydrogen is uh, potentially, I mean, it's, it's really 50-50, uh, meaning half the crowd will say hydrogen, 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 and the other half will say no. Mm -hmm. But it is a up. broad ecosystem to, yeah. Yeah, there is, and, and we're actually involved in doing a deal in hydrogen, and all the airlines are involved in it, and the, the government of Saudi Arabia is involved in it through its uh, various projects. So, and there's no one hydrogen. There's like green, blue, brown, gray. So, is that true? Really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, I learned something that hydrogen has different colors. Thank you for the question. Last question. Go ahead. My question is about nuclear energy as a replacement to fossil fuel. In China, they have developed a battery which lasts for five years without charging and it's coin cell size. In, in Japan, they are developing smaller reactors, thorium-based reactors, which have much lower half-life than uranium. And uh, in, in America also, here in uh, East Bay, there is a national ignition factory in a facility in Livermore. They are working on fusion uh, breakthrough, but I don't see anything being done in, in the VC arena here in Silicon Valley. Why it is so? Uh, and that is a very, very, will, will have very big impact on carbon emissions and everything, methane, everything. If we have uh, uh, viable fusion energy or anything like that. So, so there are some exciting things like Playground is uh, uh, doing some stuff in fusion. Um, but I think when you have a 10-year fund, a technology that's been 10 years away for 50 years can, can make you a little bit nervous because, you know, we're talking about something that let's say we crack it in the next couple of years and then we have to commercialize it and then we have to get through all this regulatory stuff. So there's this terrible nervousness. And, and of course, every time there's a nuclear incident, everybody gets nervous and you're always vulnerable in a democracy to a change of, of um, you know, the regulation where you might have a plant that has a 40-year payback period. So I think the the big hope for nuclear, and I, I agree, it'd be fantastic if we could do more of it, and we certainly shouldn't be retiring existing nuclear in Europe, um, would be these small modular reactors that are, um, you know, a couple of friends of mine are working on that sort of thing. And I think that's the interim stage between here and large commercial fusion. And and that might be VC backable. Yeah, but the, the Chinese work is really amazing because that's such a small thing using radio isotope, and it's done by a private company. It's not government work like that. Well, it, it's in some ways easier in a place like China where maybe uh, there isn't an election that... Um, um, okay. uh, you okay. go ahead Thank and do you. that. You. <laughs> uh, so so you, if you don't have to worry about an election, then maybe you can, you can make slightly longer-term plans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for the panel. All right. You guys are awesome. Ladies, fabulous. Thanks for the audience. What a great set of questions. And back to Rob. Well, I was going to say, let's give it up for Armin, our awesome moderator. <laughs>